I am so excited to be here. Thank you all very, very much. Welcome to my presentation on AI's Leap, Shaping Tailored Learning. Any guesses about the picture? Anyone? Try this. All right. Only, okay, so anybody, I think I need AV to, <laughs> to get it behind me. Um, all right, we're gonna go because I've got a ton of stuff to do. Oh, perfect. Um, any chance we can get it projected? Oh, just the two sides. Okay, good, great, we're good. So picture, allegory of the cave. This is, um, Plato used this, this analogy, really talking about the prisoner that we are when we're in our own mind's reality. I remember being a student and learning about this and I'm like, get up, go outside, and go see what's going on. What we're gonna talk about is there's a three act talk that I'm giving you today and I'm gonna do two commercial breaks I was taught a long time ago, if you had a stage, make sure that you use it to promote all your people. There is one takeaway. I want you guys all walking out of here thinking that you belong in AI. You belong here right now. I've played many roles in my life and I feel like I've had many careers. The one that I keep back, coming back to is my first love of ancient history. I love the element of discovering something new. Over the years, I've learned to observe and withhold my own judgment, or guesses, about who people are, and I'm always rewarded with surprise and delight. My observation is that human beings are just getting started. We have a central paradox in that we all want to be special and we all want to belong. In my experience, it's simply a choice that we make to do both. We are all part of our ecosystem and we are all so very human. We contain multitudes. I was asked for a quote when I started doing this keynote and I was asked to be a featured speaker. And this quote comes from Pablo Neruda. And he says, is four the same for four for everyone? Are sevens always equal? When I, what struck me about this quote was of course, um, you know, somebody who asked ex excellent questions, which Neruda did, another one of his questions is, um, does the earth chirp like a cricket in the symphony of the sky? And because he was asking so many good questions, I decided on this one because I found out that four is actually not the same four for everyone. In a lot of Eastern Asian languages, four is phonetically pronounced the same as ji, which is the word for death. So in a lot of um, hospitals especially, there's no fourth, 14th, or 24th floor. So to answer Neruda very literally, four is not the same four for everyone. So to connect the dots, the full quote is about the prisoner and contrasting mathematics with imprisonment and asking us to use this contrast to question how we think about equity and equality. And again, the prison is the mind and the reality that we think our own mental models on how shapes us. So let's go into the mind of the human being. First, history is written by humans. I mentioned I was an archeologist Simplicity is the best here, so it's, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stubborn. It took me a long time to figure out what this really means. And much like data scientists today, our historical record has been decided by too few humans. If we want a representative sample of humans involved in creating and training AI, we need 1.6 billion people. We need 1.6 billion people to decide on where the attention goes, decide on weights and measures and hyperparameters of algorithms, decide on what data sets to use. And if we look at all of these archeologists, there's like 51 of them, three of them are women, and none of these people are alive today, and these are the top archeologists according to Google. All humans are biased, all history is written by human beings, therefore all humans are biased. Let's take a look at the Cognitive Bias Codex. There is no way to remove or eradicate bias. It is part of all of us, it's part of how we think, how we are 
how our data, our reality, everything that is part of us, the best we can do is become aware of it and become explicit about it. Let's dive in for a second. What, what should we remember? We tend to discard specifics in order to understand generalities, and we edit and reinforce memories after the fact. We need to act fast. Everything's going really, really quickly, and in order to be acting, we've got to be confident that what we can do can make an impact and feel what we do is important. Not enough meaning, we imagine things and people we're familiar with or fond of as better. Big, huge sigh here. We are not meant, we are not built to know what is happening in all parts of our world at once. Between the fear of missing out and compassion fat fatigue, our world of endless information is crippling. My prescription is the same as what we do at Bast AI, sanitize your inputs. To quote Max Ehrman, beyond wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and stars, and you have the right to be here. We are drawn to details that confirm our own existing beliefs. History is written by humans. All humans are biased. Let's talk about how AI is a mirror. The center mirror in this picture is an AI-generated mirror I did for a podcast friend of mine. I studied Etruscan archaeology specifically, and the patina color of bronze is an especially beautiful blue. The Etruscan mirror was found as an artifact of the Etruscan civilization, which was at its height in 500 BCE. This civilization is strongly influenced the Roman civilization. There are arguably many reasons and theories on how these mirrors were used, but listen to what ChatGPT states. Etruscan mirrors were primarily made from bronze and were highly polished to achieve the reflective surface. These mirrors were not just a utilitarian objects for personal grooming, they also held cultural and religious significance. All right, humans are natural storytellers. Here's a truth. Asking why prompts human beings to impose meaning and create explanations when even none exist. Before I looked that up on ChatGPT, the joke that I've been telling for years is that when an archaeologist doesn't know what something is, well, it must have been religious. Correlation is not causation, but it sure is a hint. Judea Pearl wrote a whole book on what happens when we ask the question why. To review, history is written by humans. All humans are biased. AI is a mirror, it's a reflection of our data, our history, what we feed into it. And humans are natural storytellers. So now I'm gonna give you a vocabulary, a common foundation, and let's start with some definition of terms. Data is an artifact of human experience. A human being either created the data or created the system that created the data. In all of the years that I have been saying this, only one person has said, well, Beth, what about tree rings? I said, okay, well, if I can understand trees in the context of their data, maybe we can, we can actually say data is an artifact of living experience. This is a little bit of an anecdote on why materials matter. John Maida speaks about temples that stand for 1,000 years. And how the master architects created these temples is they took the wood on the west side of the temple from the west side of the mountain. And they took the wood from the east side of the temple from the trees on the east side of the mountain and the south side and the north side. If we're gonna build something that is durable and has a lengthy duration, we need to make sure that our data and our data sets hold up. We need to have durability. This is my daughter when she was like four. As my good friend Phil Kamarni says, timing is innovation. Anyone who has worked in information or data systems understand that time is the ultimate dimension. Like archaeology, we have to make sense out of a few artifacts that we find as an event. We put a lot of our own biases and our own information around that. But we need to remember, data is a flow. Perception is the rule, in this I am certain. A poignant quote from George Bernard Shaw, 
The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. The tree, or data, is the only part of the story the forest or the context provides information. Data is most valuable when it's considered within context. Information is data plus context. Here's a beautiful picture of Colorado. Knowledge is information plus relationships, also known as a knowledge graph or an ontology which connects entities and their relationships. Ontology is also a branch of philosophy that studies the nature of your reality based on the language you use. On the panel this morning, we were talking about mental models. What we can do with AI now is understand the nature of your reality based on the language you use by mapping it to a knowledge graph or an ontology. Here's an ontology in action, and I'm doing this one on purpose, and I know that it's really hard to see, and I don't mean for y'all to like, have to try to read it, but what I did is we created an ontology of emotions, traits, and behaviors. According to Brene Brown and her research, most human beings only have four or five words for how they feel. If we give people vocabulary and we give people the understanding of what is a trait, what is a behavior, and what is an emotion, an emotion is a feeling that we feel in our body. <laughs> We can give people a whole vocabulary to be able to express themselves. This relates to one of the commercial breaks I'm about coming up, but I wanted to leave you with this very last vocabulary piece. Wisdom is in stories. All right, commercial break. Valence Vibrations. This is a um, company that is run from a friend of mine, Chloe. And she created a Apple Watch interface that allows people like me to understand the emotions on my watch based on the valence or the tone that I'm using. She and I want to get together and hook it up to that, that emotional ontology so that we can really start to understand how we're feeling, how we're thinking, and how we're expressing ourselves to other people. And a lot of this is because people like me don't always understand how other people's facial expressions render into emotion. Now that we have a foundation, I really want to do explainable AI in practice. We got one more commercial break. Back to a regularly scheduled program. What is explainable AI exactly? Every time I get the chance, I try to bring up this Venn diagram. I cannot believe how many people in my life over the years wanted to talk about what was really AI and what wasn't. It took me a long time to figure out that maybe they weren't really talking about it, and I kind of use this pretty bad joke that uh, it's, like, it, it's like sex. You know, teenagers, they like to talk about it, but those that are doing it aren't talking about it. I've always been in the natural language processing side, which I break down as three components. Natural language processing has natural language understanding, natural language classification, which is your prediction, and natural language generation. The generative AI is the current, current rage. My quip is that understanding is the really, really hard part, because understanding is a labor, not an act. This picture is the work of in the incredible El Elliot Irwin, and this is titled The Master of the Decisive Moment. Artificial intelligence, and I borrow this from um, my friend Adam Cutler, um, and all of the work that people do at IBM for everyday ethics, but artificial intelligence is really simple. It's a system capable of simulating human intelligence and thought processes, just like this picture from Elliot Irwin. Anybody heard of Randall Monroe, XKCD fans? Woohoo! Yes, geeks in the house. All right, so this is pretty funny because like, I use this all the time. This is actually on the open source data science method that we put out there in the world so people could scale AI responsibly. Is this your machine learning system? 
Yep, you pour all the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. But what if the answers are wrong? Oh, just stir the pile until they start looking right. In case you don't get where I'm going, I, uh, I used this blog that was recently put out by somebody who's worked at OpenAI for almost a whole year. And he says that, um, you know, he, he's, he's done more models than anybody has a right to, to do. And um, he says something really important here. And he says that the model behavior is not determined by architecture, hyperparameters, or optimizer choices. It's determined by your data set and nothing else. And what I wanted to show you here, and this is something that I think is, is really interesting, is um, this is a, let's see if I can get it to go. Nope, all right, we'll do it the other way. So this is um, part of my program, and I am gonna try to see if I can read some of this to you because I really wanted to show it. Um, what we do in BAST AI is we take in any data, any unstructured data, and then we create a system of record, and then we interact with that system of record with full referenceability. So what I'm doing is I'm asking my AI, which I call a cat, or a conversational AI technology, little reductive, um, and what I'm asking is I'm like, what are, what are machines good at? And then it gives me a reference point and it brings up the page in my book where I talk about what machines are good at. And machines are good at probabilities, analyzing large amounts of data. They're really, really sensitive. Machines are very sensitive. And then what I'm doing over here right now is I'm showing you the full lineage and provenance and then the context of what I used in order to be able to generate the, the response. And responses generated from context are much better as well as actually they, they give you the, the reason why the AI generated the thing that they generated. Again, that, that question why, it's really important. Okay, so here is another pretty big concept that I wanna try to put in y'all's brains today. Randomness is a fundamental property of nature. It is truly magical. Somebody once said, uh, chance is something that is way too important to leave up to randomness. Humans can do random, computers can't. To this day, why do you think they have lottery jigglers? Computers cannot create random systems. And this is really important because everything that a computer does is based on its input and computers are binary. They're based on zeros and ones, until we get to some quantum computers, of course. And what I understand is humans can do randomness, but if they think about it or they observe it, they can't do it. And there's this really great story of a professor who puts a human being in a room and she tells him to actually flip a coin 100 times. And then she sits another human in a room and say, just write down, tails or heads a hundred times. She looks at the results and she can tell which one is done by the human who actually flipped the coin and the human who couldn't. And the reason is, is that real randomness looks a lot different than what we think it does. Real randomness, like the guy who flipped the coin a hundred times, got seven tails in a row. If you start flipping the coin, and you get seven tails in a row at the first, that's a 1% probability that you're gonna do that. That's your odds. If you do it within 100 flips, there's a 33% chance that you're gonna get seven tails in a row. That human being that's sitting there going tails, heads, 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 nope, tails, they're thinking to themselves, hey, I think I need to switch it up because it needs to look random. It needs to look like the person who's actually flipping the coin. Human beings suck at probabilities. This is a picture of Ada Lovelace and Alan Turing. It's really important to remember that Ada Lovelace lived less than 200 years ago, and she was the very first programmer working with Charles Babbage, and she was the daughter of Lord Byron, the poet. 
Alan Turing, when he wrote about computers and we, when he wrote about the Turing test, he described all of the computers that we have today, but he also described something else in addition to that. He, d he called it an oracle, and he said we would know about it because it wasn't a machine. It could do something random. Humans personify. Personification and anthropomorphism is a way for us to relate to our world and build a shared reality. It's how we work. I asked ChatGPT why humans personify and anthropomorphize. Enhancing storytelling and art. Building emotional connections. Exploring identity and the human condition. Religious and mythological significance. Hmm. Our history is written. Should we allow our future to be as well? The sun is smiling today. This is a great example of personification. We're social animals. We want to anthropomorphize. Humans are built to find patterns. A short story about Michael J. Fox, and this is a meme that, that I pulled off the internet because I knew I could use it. Um, I think everybody knows that he has Parkinson's disease, and if any of you have a chance, still is an excellent documentary. A treatment to Parkinson's causes the dopamine system to hy be hyper-responsive, and they found that it can cause compulsive gambling in this tragic story of a woman in a small town. She was given this treatment and gambled away her whole life savings because she was compelled to find the pattern in the slot machine. It was also kind of a zero-sum game because the slot machine lights up in our, in our heads and tells us and gives us bells and whistles and say, you're close, you're close, you're close. She couldn't stop and she would buy milk that was sour or she would forget to eat. But the moment she stopped taking the drug, she stopped gambling. What this told us as scientists is that our brains are built to find patterns. Stories are how we share reality. Stories allow individuals to experience emotions, challenges, and resolutions together. They foster a sense of shared understanding and empathy. This collective emotional journey can bridge diverse backgrounds and perspectives, creating a unified experience. We can convey cultural values, memes, tropes, norms. norms. We can uh, facilitate empathy and understanding. We have processing for healing and trauma, enabling social learning, building identity and unity. And I put this up here with Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote an amazing book, but his research really was even bigger. He got PTSD in the DSM. That means that you know, folks like my husband who went to three deployments could understand how their brains worked. And human beings with our stories, we have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end in order to be able to understand the narrative. When trauma occurs, it breaks this up. And we now know that when trauma happens, we have to get a narrative around that in order to understand why that happened. There's that why world word again. Okay, next. Showing the work feels awesome. Here's a picture of my kid. He's 19 now. He was a lot cuter then. I also like his shirt. So what we're doing with, um, with explainable AI, and um, this is a little bit of a showcase that I wanted to run. Um, again, you can't read it, and I understand that, but what I did and what our conversational AI or our cats are doing at Maryville University, we are so excited. <laughs> we, um, we just got through some student focus groups and some teacher focus groups, but we created an AI companion that allows students to have a unified version of the course material. And every single answer is generated with full lineage and provenance of where it got its answer. And we bring up a page in order to show what that, what that note was. And what we think is really interesting is that you can ask it to generate quiz questions. You can ask it to generate scenario-based 
systems. You can ask it to create all of these things where an AI companion can work interactively with a nurse against trusted source data that is fully engineered to make sure that they know exactly where they get the data from. One of the things that we do really well at BAST is we show our work. So in this very last scenario, which you can't see and I understand, what, what I did is I turned on the explainability mode because I asked it a question about something that was not on that week's exam. And we have the context to only say, hey, this isn't actually in this week's exam, but here you go, here's an answer and here's a reference for that answer. It does not hallucinate, it does not go off script, it is fully engineered, it is created to make sure that it only interacts with that system of record, making sure that Maryville, Maryville's IP is fully protected and fully interrogable in that system of record that we've created for them. To review, humans are magical in the way that we can tune into our ecosystem and actually do random things. Computers are not magical because they can't do randomness. They are based on binary systems and are encoded with rules, including how AI functions. Humans are pattern recognition machines, pun intended, and giving people the understanding of how AI works feels good. It feels good in our body. We are literally feeling the experience of emotion of joy and awe and a, and a good dopamine plug <laughs> when we figure out a pattern and how things work. When we're teaching the nurses how the AI is reasoning against the body of data, they learn how to reason with it. They learn how they reason differently than all of their other classmates. It's time for our second commercial break. This is redocracy. In a world where we obsess over how we feel in our bodies, why are we so careless with how we feed our minds? What you pay attention to becomes who you are. Sanitize your inputs. In the same way that you interrogate your Fitbit or how Apple health data or sleep data, what does that look like for your information diet? Redocracy also has the capacity to give you credit for all of the information that you read and all the information that you consume. We're working with Redocracy in order to create a personal docent for your, or a personal librarian for all of the systems that you read so you can say, hey, cat, what was that thing that I read the other day when I was on the treadmill that I'd really want to like get back to? So we've understood the foundation Hopefully, I've given you a little bit of understanding of how explainable AI is used in practice. It's not just about ethics. It's about how we can teach people how they learn, how we can teach people how to learn how to learn. Now I'm going to give a little bit of a vision for the future. What people are good at is compassion, being social, and telling stories. I pulled this from Kai-Fu Lee, How AI Can Save Our Humanity. And this is a old, old <laughs> diagram, but what I like, well, old by 2018 old. And why I really like it is because everything in red and yellow, these are the things that are not gonna be automated. And the story that I, I tell and the things that I think is that in the future, somebody's not going to go to school for four years to be able to interpret radiology reports. That radiology machine is going to send something to your personal AI so that that will be interpreted for you for your body. And I don't think that's like four months away. I think education, teachers, all the educators in the audience, you guys have a special set of skills and you have those skills that you need, to, you need to figure out. And with me, I'd like to see a world where all of these people in red and yellow, these are the people that get paid the most. Because the value system is off. The distribution is off. I've done a lot of hiring, firing, promotion boards. The single biggest skill 
that you need in industry. And I, I've, I've been in industry my whole life. And when I first went into education and I realized that everybody in education is trying to figure out what industry needs, I was like, oh, I don't think they care. <laughs> Um, the only skill that you really need is likability. But they don't say that. They say cultural fit. <laughs> these other seven, these, these are the ones that matter. And you can call them soft skills, like my soft science of archaeology, or you know, durable skills, or life skills, lots and lots of things that we can do with these types of skills. But these are the skills that, that computers can't do. These are the skills that we need to be teaching to our children. Every AI skill and future skills research mentions a combination of these skills as well, every single one. Most of these skills also relate to being a mom. OK. Oops. Social learning use cases for today. So these are things that we are doing today. I showed you a little bit of that, that nurse cat that we're doing as an AI knowledge companion. What we're also doing is providing the teacher an understanding of which student is asking what question in the direct message, and then enabling positive reinforcement by having the AI suggest that that question be put into the main channel so that the other students can benefit from that question. This is a simple thing. And it's something that we humans do all the time. We teachers do it all. Generational collaboration, collecting, uh, connecting uh, our alumni to students and fostering a culture of lifelong learning. I always say that we need a vertical and horizontal stratification of diversity. In my panel today, we had a five-year-old in our, in, our, in our audience. That's diversity. We, we need to think differently about how we are interacting with our older generations. We need to understand ancestral intelligence, and it's a term that I'm playing around with, because artificial intelligence implies that something is created out of nothing, that artificial intelligence is created out of something that didn't exist before. It's artificial, and that's not true. Artificial intelligence is totally based on the data sets that are used to create the training data and to create the, the models and to create all of it. And that's our ancestral intelligence. And right now, it's only, been, it, it's only being done by very, very few people. Back to my original 51 archaeologists really talking about history and codifying that. Everybody says, hey, the, the victors write the history. I'm like, no, the archaeologists do. Industry upskilling and reskilling on traditional campuses. This is something that um, I'm pushing for because I think it needs to happen. Industry and college need to connect. Every single large corporation has to upskill and reskill their people. The cost of replacing somebody is 250%. 250%. All corporations have to do this upskilling and reskilling. Why not do it on college campuses? Then you have casual collisions between your pipeline and your placement. I'm going to do a bigger vision of the future. And this, uh, this beautiful cat, and by the way, I named my company after the Egyptian cat goddess. When we created this cat, we also created a vision. And this vision really requires you to have data sovereignty. And that's where I think we're going. Here's an idea that we have about commercialization on how you could go to Epcot Center, this beautiful ge geodesic dome, and you can have a, a conversation with your younger self because you can leave a graffiti mark that only your AI and your personal device understands. I think this could happen in six months. Today we embark on a journey together a journey through the evolving landscape of our digital world, a world where the very essence of our identities, our personal data, weaves through the fabric of the internet like threads through a vast, intricate tapestry. In the dawn of a digital age, we marveled at the possibilities the internet provided, 
promise to be the great equalizer, the domain where knowledge, commerce, and communication could flourish beyond the boundaries of physical space. And flourish it did. But as we navigated this new world, we realized that our digital footsteps were tracing a, past we, a path we had not intended, a path where our personal data, our digital selves, became commodities traded and exploited without our consent. But what if we could reimagine this narrative? What if, in this vast digital landscape, we could assert our sovereignty over our personal data? Imagine a world where our digital identities are respected as extensions of ourselves, where the control of this personal data rests firmly in the hands of its rightful owner, you and me. It's something that we should have. If the internet actually had figured out versioning and lineage and provenance when it was created, we'd have a very different world. Right now, we have the ability to take anybody's personal data and create all kinds of things with it. But I think it changes when you're doing it for yourself. Last thing I really wanted to leave you with is a call to action. I'd really like you to join our movement. If you want to scan this code, we really want to see how we can create this vision for a world that can create um, total data sovereignty for everybody. All right. I'd love to take any questions. First question, how do I see AI being leveraged to support neurodiverse learners in successfully completing higher ed? I think, um, I, I think that neurodiverse learners, and, and I, uh, one of my, it, I live in Colorado and have had the, the pleasure and honor to meet Temple Grandin several times. And I think that you know, many of us who are neurodiverse are huge proponents of figuring out how we can be a lot more open and talk about what's been, you know, what our, what our paths have been. I mean, I, I don't think there's an easy answer, but we've got to change the system. Can AI ever be ethical when it's largely based on data that is taken without consent? Um, I don't know. I think that we get to decide, and I do know that every single human being is, who is involved in the creation of AI should be accountable for its impact on the world. But we don't need large data sets harvested without consent. We can create AI with small data, and that small, well-ordered labeled data sets, everybody agrees. That, is, that high quality data, that will be a better experience, and that's the next generation of AI that we're creating. How I advocate for the inclusion of diverse learning, oh, diverse, diverse voices and perspectives in the development and deployment of AI technology to ensure equitable outcomes. I am standing on stage advocating my, my butt off. I, <laughs> I think every single one, and I heard this today, um, when you think of the word um, accomplice, what do you guys think of? Yeah. When you think of the word ally, what do you think of? <laughs> LGBTQ. Accomplice was a crime. I think we need to be accomplices. I think we need to take that word back. And I think that we need to do more than advocate. I think that we need to, we, we, we need to do a lot more than just be allies. We need to be a part of the movement. Should we focus on tailored learning, assuming relationships between students and computers, or giving teachers the ability to customize teaching for every student? Yes and yes. I think that the best thing that teachers can do is model how to use an AI. Sit there with your students and ask the AI questions. I said this this morning on the panel, AI is great if you're already wise. If you know the questions to ask, you should be doing that with your students and teaching them how to ask the right questions because many of us grew up in an era where we weren't supposed to ask teachers questions. That would be disruptive. 
The skills I listed are those that moms, women are typically score higher on, or what are the implications considering that men de dominate the AI sector right now? I mean, again, one of the things that we're looking to use our artificial intelligence for and, and what we're doing with BAST is being able to help. Um, we're working with some folks on welfare in Canada as well as the, the US Chamber of Commerce to be able to help moms understand the skills that they have and give them that language variation. So we're working on a, on a system that asks the mom, hey, how many kids you have? And the mom says, hmm, I got four kids under 10. And the AI goes, oh, hey, you have negotiation skills. You have supply chain skills. <laughs> you understand logistics. You understand critical thinking. You understand conflict resolution. And then that AI walks that mom through why she has those skills. Because if you have a credential and you don't know how to use it, it's not real worth anything. How do I navigate the balance between driving profitable enterprise outcomes and AI technologies while ensuring ethical considerations remain at the forefront? I think that profitable and prof profitability, I really think we're at the peak of that pendulum. I don't know though. I think that there's a lot that we need to be doing and part of my vision for data sovereignty in that beginning of a manifesto I read you I think that if we could figure out a way that we could engage consumers to use their own data to build their own AI systems, I think it changes the narrative and it really starts to democratize what we can actually build together. Specific traits of a teacher that a future AI would not be able to intimidate or imitate. <laughs> Compassion, <laughs> empathy, I think that a computer could simulate that, but I don't think that it could truly imitate. And simulation and imitate are, are very different things. I also think that you know my interactions with artificial intelligence and the way that I'm interacting with something that I actually trust, it gives me a different way that I'm starting to question things, and it gives me a different, you know, a different line of reasoning to be curious about. So I think that the teachers and the teacher's curiosity about activating different pieces of curiosity. Remember, you can't be curious about something you don't know about. And I think that AI opens up a whole new world to being able to see things in different perspectives. We can be like that prisoner and get up and go outside. We don't have to be regulated to one view of reality. We don't have to think about like what we are taught and then teach the children what we are taught, unless that's something that we choose to do with purpose. I do think that data sovereignty could lead to basic income. I don't know that I have a, a strong view on that. I'm a bit of a workaholic, so I like to work. It feels good. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if basic income makes you not want to work, but I do think that the distribution of wealth is not is not just the answer. I think it's only part of the answer. I think you gotta distribute the wealth and the work. Hardware and connectivity needed to use many of these AI tools effectively. On average, a large language model training cycle, and this was, I don't know, a couple months ago, which was years in our AI time, it took 15 swimming pools full of fresh water to complete one single cycle. Many of the models that are built, though, require large, large volumes of data, and there's a difference between quantity and quality. If you use small volumes of high-quality data, you do not need lots of compute. And this is, this is one of the biggest truths <laughs> that we could get out there, is that all of the data that is necessary in order to train a model could be on your hard drive or could be in a couple books. What does the future of teacher or what does the future teacher look like? I think it looks like a, a wide representation of human beings. Again, that representative sample, 1.6 billion people. That's a 20% or a two-tailed distribution 
of 8 billion. So 1.6 billion, I think that that's what the future teacher looks like. If AI simulates human intelligence and depends on input from humans, how are we careful not to have AI reinforce oppressive and harmful biases? That's why we get to choose and be in control. And we should be able to see the actual actions that the artificial intelligence is showing that we're taking it. There's a great story, and it's quick, about a ethical AI system that was done in Spain Edicas, and they actually reviewed what happened to the police force who, um, they had an AI model that guessed the level of threat or harm for domestic violence. And unfortunately, 16 women who were assessed as low threat level died. And so they had their entire AI system assessed and they realized that the AI system was just reflecting what those police men and the cases before it. We're at the end of opacity, and I think the age of transparency, and I think that we definitely are starting to see how AI is a mirror of what we think and what we feel. Given the legal frameworks that don't exist in this country, what is the first step to establishing data ownership of any type beyond the possession is ownership? So remember that picture of my cute little girl? Data is a flow, not an event. We can change our minds. And um, I was talking to my husband, who's a soldier, and he was telling me a funny story about um, Russia, who was quickly collecting all of our rules and all of our governance. And he said, he goes, you know, the Russians are always so baffled because we Americans, we don't follow our own rules. I think of that story when I think about you know, data sovereignty, and I think about how we can, we can start at any time. We can change our minds. We don't have to follow our own rules. I want to teach young students how to interact with AI, like that five-year-old attendee you mentioned. How would you safely facilitate a one-on-one -on -one interaction with him? My, um, <laughs> My son is 19 now, and when he was a kid and first started interacting with the internet, there were, there were no parental guidelines. And he learned real quick what you know, a big black snake looked like. Um, I would say that you need to do it with them. It is that simple. And it is hard because being with your child and sitting with your child and having the time to do so is a privilege in this country. But that is the way to safely interact with AI, is do it with them. Make sure that they understand how it's working, how you're asking it. Humans do what you do, not what you say. Quantum computers are coming <laughs> and work very well with AI. What happens to the concept of randomness lacking in machines? I could have a very long conversation with this. <laughs> I, I do not know, but I do think that Quarks change their behavior when they're observed. I'd like that 1.6 billion people making those observations, not just a few. Hopefully no more questions. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.